Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to understand these great truths that you have. <clears throat> Things that we know and see but don't necessarily understand what they are. I pray, Lord, to help us to uh, fill in more of our doctrine as we progress in spiritual maturity. And I ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we are November the 5th, 2023, Sunday. Um, if you're here, then you actually turned your clocks back like you were supposed to. And that's a good thing. Um, just as a note, uh, next week, next Sunday, we'll still have class. My wife won't be on the other side of the phone to answer any questions or to type out anything. Uh, but we are still having the class. And if you have questions, just leave them on there and then I'll answer them uh, at the end of class um, via Facebook, I suppose that would be. So we're going to be covering today Ephesians 3, 16 through 18. I don't know if we'll get to 18, but we'll see. These are pretty intense doctrines here they're, they're uh, as you can see from the verses um, you know uh, just to let you know I think you, if you've actually looked at these verses uh, you don't I bring up four usually three or four of them but if you actually look at these verses you'll see they're out of order many times and that's because they're actually by subject within the so if there's a doctrine here like glorious riches it may be in this one and this one and strengthen you uh, by the, by power through who that is, uh, the spirit might be in some other ones. So they're, they're kind of lined up like that, just so that you know that they don't, a few of them, especially the, the parallel Colossian verses, are pretty good at um, kind of paralleling, because we've talked about it. it's kind of a sister book. Not really, it's not really a sister book, but it has some of the same doctrines come up because it's uh, written at the same time. Um, so anyway, we're going to hope to get through that. I'm going to... I've had this on for three weeks. So I'm going to get rid of it. I hope you can see it. I don't know if you can see down here, but <clears throat> I'll tell you what it is. Uh, there's a one here. If you remember, we first covered this. The, uh, this is about prayer, and this is the subject we're in. Uh, and just so, I'll put this one back up here. Filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, just to help you see where we're at. So in prayer, all prayers to be offered to God the Father, as we had up here before, in the filling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, And that just means that as a believer, you have no sins between you and God. Um, you've confessed them, 1 John 1, 9. And you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And this talks about it up in this verse here. But that's not what we're talking about. It just happens to be the same subject as the prayer. <clears throat> there are exceptions to the filling of the Holy Spirit with prayer. Okay, and just so that you know what they are, because this is kind of a, a fill in the doctrine piece. The, the first exception to it is that if you've grieved the Holy Spirit, that means you've sinned with sin. This is for believers. So this, the two of these are for believers, one for an unbeliever. Uh, this is always for the believer. This is why um, God does not listen to the prayers of unbelievers with the exception of salvation, of faith in Christ. And that's shown down here. But, so if you grieve the Holy Spirit, if you've sinned, which is why we always have you have the 30 seconds of quiet time, so that you can confess that sin with 1 John 1, 9, and be restored into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, not just for prayer, but also for understanding, because he's also the teacher of, of the Word of God, the true teacher of the of Word of God, who actually talks to your human spirit uh, and your soul to help you understand things that are spiritually discerned. Uh, the second one is that w if you quench the Holy Spirit, uh, we call this reversionism. It's a term we've picked up, kind of like driving backwards. It's much better than, uh, than uh, backsliding. <clears throat> and this means that you've actually stayed in sin. The difference between grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit is this one here is in a temporary state of, uh, of uh, loss of fellowship because you sin. That's what happens. You lose fellowship with, with God. And um, so what you do is that you can actually, when you pray 1 John 1, 9, you confess your sins back. As a believer, you're restored, restored back to fellowship. This is a person who has not restored themselves to fellowship. They've lived in their sin for a while. And what they've done is they've quenched the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit stops speaking to them. 
When you walk with God and you, and you mess something up, the Holy Spirit retrieves you by having a conversation uh, with you, talks to you. He's a regular part of your life. And he reminds you of that sin. And then you hopefully choose to get rid of that sin uh, by confessing it. You know, First John 1, 9. Um, and by doing that, you're restored to perfect righteousness with God in fellowship. So this is the this is a person who's been out for a while. Person may be out of fellowship. Hopefully you're not. But some people, when they stop going to church, you know, when they stop doing Bible study, when they they just make a decision and they kind of leave they kind of leave the Lord behind. And so later on, they come to have something happen to them usually because they're being divine discipline. They put themselves in that spot and they confess it. They don't have to be saved again. That rededication stuff is complete rubbish. <clears throat> um, you, you confess your sin and you turn back to the Lord. This is a heart change. Heart meaning this heart, okay, a mentality of the soul, who you really are. And then you return back and then you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you change your attitude towards Bible study and towards God. And now you're back in, you're back in track. You start, you start renewing uh, yourself and we'll run into that. The last prayer here is one for unbelievers. So these two are for believers. This is for an unbeliever. Uh, an unbeliever, the only time that God will listen to them, their prayers heard, is when they have faith in Christ. Otherwise, God does not hear any of their prayers. Because if you remember the piece about that, that he is not theirs in reality. He's their creator, but he's not their father. Um, and the last one here, this is a really important one, is when you get into a fight with your, with your spouse. <laughs> it's one of the pieces, and we know that from 1 Peter 3, 7, because this one seems a little odd. But in reality, if you are in a fight with your spouse, God will not listen to your prayers. I just quoted that verse, by the way, so you know what it is. It means that when you have a domestic issue, and this doesn't mean like you have a disagreement. This means when you have something where you've actually both kind of uh, moved out of your Christian grace, I'll call it, not love, but grace, you, well, love personally, relationship with God, but not love between your spouse. You've gotten into a fight with them. In reality, one or both of you are in that spot. But the truth is that that's still there. God does not listen to your prayers. Okay, that's this verse here. So now you have the, uh, the, the piece of that. I can kind of get rid of it, but that's what that stands for. <clears throat> it's been there for three weeks. I was trying to do some of the things, the supplementals to prayer, so we can kind of include them for people who are not uh, familiar with them. Okay? So let's get back to where we're at. Um, and we're, I'm just going to reread verse 15 because it really starts with 15. Uh, and then it kind of goes this way. Um, the first one I want to read, it says, uh, From whom every family in heaven and on earth um, uh, derives its name. And as we know, that's not every family. It's the whole family <coughs> of heaven. There's only one family in the family of God. Um, this is the relationship we have. If you remember from the verse before this, 14, uh, it was talking about the Father. And this is where we had the paranomasia between verses 14 and 15, telling us, and the paranomasia is just a pun. It's kind of a, you know, a, a joke made with words. And <clears throat> what happens there is that this is the part where we are shown to be in, in the Father's personal family, because of our relationship being in Christ. Um, that we are not like the family of God, but we are the family actually of the Father, which includes Jesus Christ, and our relationship is through Him, which is why it's called in Christ. And this, the joke here is that we uh, um, derives its name. If you remember, the word family is patera, and the, fa the word for uh, father is pater. And so it's a Greek inside joke that actually shows up here, but otherwise you can't tell what that means, derives its name. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we'll move on to uh, 15. This is actually also the beginning of the Trinity starting here. Um, in, in the book, this is the piece where, uh, or in the book, meaning the epistle of Ephesians, this is where it starts. So we have the, uh, the Father uh, being mentioned, and then we have the Spirit being mentioned, the first time he's mentioned, uh, specifically as the Godhead, part of the Godhead, and then we have Christ in, the, in this one here. So we actually have the Father in 15, the, the Spirit 
and Christ himself. And then Christ again is in the one after that. <clears throat> so we have the, if you ever have, the reason that's important to mention is that there are some people who do not, some who believe that they are Christians but are not. Because if you do not believe in the Trinity, in reality, you are not a believer because you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the uh, center of the Christian plan. And that's God's Father's whole plan. So if you're like a Jehovah Witness and you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God and plus our Savior, in reality, you are believing in a different, uh, different gospel, which is what Paul's talking about when he mentions that part. So it kind of leaves you high and dry. Um, and many people want to, if you look at the Pharisees in Jesus' time, uh, they had a very strong belief in the Father, yet didn't have any belief in the Son. In reality, they didn't get that part. Um, so they were not saved, and they acted like it. That's why Jesus calls them the, the sons of Satan. Um, so that's kind of a big sweep there, but it, it, hopefully it helps you orient yourself. <laughs> so verse 16 here uh, is that I pray out of his glorious riches. And remember who that is. That's God the Father. The glorious riches are the wealth provisions of God. Okay, they are the provisions in this context. The glorious riches that God has provided for us to live the Christian life in Satan's world. Okay, he has, he has provided with us. Not only that, but he has, his blessings come out of that too. And so the question you want to ask yourself always, I think, is does God the Father have um, glorious riches? Is he rich? And we know from the doctrine that everything, everything there is belongs to Christ, to who got that from God the Father. Okay, this, the, everything is the Father's is mine. That's where he says that. Now, the, the next word here, we're going to run into something. He says, he, so, um, uh, pray, I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you uh, with the power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, the next four verses, including this one, we have the word may. It's important to uh, notice it. I'm going to circle it up here, and I have it circled on mine. Um, this is really critical. I've been double underlined them. So you have may. And over here, you have may. And over here, you have may. So why do I make an issue of that? The word may is called the subjunctive, and it means potential. It means that you have to do something to get it, okay? Now, there is no more critical, <laughs> there's no more critical understanding for the believer to have to, to understand that <clears throat> if he does not meet the condition of the may, it's kind of like an if, he does not get the promise. That's always true. It'd be like here, okay, if you give me $10,000, I'll give you this car. But if you don't give me the $10,000, you don't get the car, okay? That's, that's the may. Uh, and those mays exist all the time. They're, they're conditional clauses, what they call them. Uh, one thing that, the, the, that many people who, understand, who read lots of the scriptures don't understand that, that, that in Deuteronomy 28, and I think it's a piece of numbers on it too, one of the things that's important about the Mosaic Law is that it was a conditional law. It means that if you obeyed the law, God just gave you treasure after treasure after treasure, blessed your country, uh, blessed your, the nation, blessed you, blessed your family. Bless, that's called blessing by association. Just gave you all these blessings. But about verse 15, 16, it makes a change. It says, but if you don't, Okay, you will get cursing. Your 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 family will starve. You'll all these bad. Your nation will be discarded. You will be dispersed through the whole whole world, which is exactly where they're at right now. The Jews are. So, but to remember that is that you have to read you know Deuteronomy twenty eight and understand it is a conditional clause. In order for you to have the blessings, you have to obey the law. 
Now, the Mosaic Law doesn't apply to us. We weren't on Mount Sinai in 1440 BC, and when, when Moses presented it to us, which he didn't, he presented it to the Jews and the Jews alone, <coughs> and they said yes, that was their yes. We don't have that for us. We're the end of the law. We don't have a law. We have a uh, we have a conditional relationship of grace, okay? And grace is conditional. There's a conditional piece there. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. If you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved, okay? So there's conditional. So these things are important to remember. When you see a may, you want to make sure you understand what that condition is because you want to make sure you meet it. If you don't meet it, you don't get the promise, okay? Important thing to remember. Now, this verse is really, really a great verse. Um, again, here, this is the continuation of the uh, Trinity piece here. Uh, and the other thing to remember about all this piece in Ephesians, specifically this, is the same principle that we have. We are, because we are Christians, we parallel, and this is the Christian age, we parallel that anything you see that's written to the Ephesians, because they are Christians, we also are under that same thing. On the, on the other hand, if you look under the Mosaic Law, and you look even in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and before into the Old Testament, you are not, part, you are not a Jew, and so that, could, that doesn't actually apply to you. Now, does the principle apply to you? It might, if it is a moral principle or a clause of some sort that is one of those who carries itself through time, but not all of them do, like the law. Law doesn't carry itself through time. That's why we're not, doing, that's why we're not sacrificing anything today. Cutting any lamb's throat or, or, uh, or calf's throat or ripping birds in half. We're not doing any of that because we don't belong to that part. Okay? So that should be very uh, straightforward. Um, this is the stuff, the promises that are here, the glorious riches here that's important for us is that this is God's provision for us as part of the mystery doctrine. Remember, we covered that in the beginning. That God provided for us that is unique to Christianity. Uh, those are really straightforward ones, okay? I mean, we're filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can do divine things. Who was filled with the Holy Spirit in, in the Old Testament? Virtually nobody. Very, very few. Less than 1% of all the people mentioned, mentioned not, not including all the other people uh, that weren't mentioned who were believers, which is millions and millions, they did not have, they had what they called, it's commonly termed as an endowment, they had a temporary uh, Holy Spirit to help them perform a particular task. We are not like that. In reality, the riches of our gracious, uh, the, riches of the, the glorious riches that God the Father has given for us is the filling of the, as the potentiality, the may, okay, uh, of filling of the Holy Spirit. And that not the indwelling. We have the indwelling permanently and forever. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is a whole different matter. It means that as a Christian, you have no sin between you and God. You have confessed it, and by confessing it, you have been cleansed from all unrighteousness, and you are now in fellowship with God again. Okay? Uh, but these, these things that God is providing for us is for a tactical victory in phase two in life, the mission that we have here, to kind of be the cleanup crew for the victory that Christ bought. On the, on the cross, okay, where Satan was condemned. Um, so here, we, we also have here is that we have a, uh, a piece here where it said we're, the, the strong part that's talking about in here, I'm just going to give you kind of a prelude, um, is the power of the Holy Spirit, without whom, this is important to remember when we get to it, without whom we can only have human power. We're, not, we're just like anybody else. In reality, when a believer is out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, in reality, he has no more power than an unbeliever. Okay? What he does is human. In reality, God does not accept human works. How do we know that? We know that from the cross. It was rejected. Meaning that God doesn't accept all these human good things that I can do and all of a sudden say, Oh, Rich, you, you, meet, you met that goal. I had, I had 10,000. You just did it. You are now saved and you did it on your own. Great job. That's blasphemy, by the way. But it, it's a tongue-in-cheek understanding that human power, it's, it's important for us to understand that if we don't use these glorious riches, in reality, we are impotent. 
and God knows we were impotent because we have powers in this world, demons and, and, uh, and the devil, who are infinitely more powerful than us. Now, I don't really mean infinitely. I just mean much, much, much more. Okay, um, like Satan himself. So this is how the divine enablement for us to do the works of God, divine works, is supplied to us through this glorious riches. And we, there's other ones too. Um, the piece that's here, that's also in here, is that without uh, Bible doctrine, without the principles of, of Scripture, without the knowledge of what's called the mind of Christ in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 16, <clears throat> without that, we cannot know what a divine work looks like. There is a criteria for it, okay, versus a human viewpoint, okay? A human good can be done by an unbeliever, okay? But we know from Isaiah 66, 3, 2, Two, I think of this, where it says, your filthy rags, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags to me. That's God talking about us. So we need to know those things. And this is kind of what's in here. The inner man in this piece right here um, is a uh, coined word. Means Coined just means he made it up. In reality, Paul makes up a lot of words. He puts like epinosis. Epinosis is one that's not a standard word. It means fullness of of, of knowledge, which means the knowledge of God between gnosis and epinosis. Some of those you're familiar with. So the inner man here is actually talking about the human spirit. Um, we'll cover the human spirit next Sunday when we kind of put some of those verses together to help us to differentiate it when we see it <clears throat> and what its role is. We talked about it, I think, about two weeks ago about the human spirit and how important it is. It is the part, the human spirit is the part that's given to you at the moment of salvation. And in reality, it is the part that allows you to understand the spiritual truths of the Holy Spirit when he does them through us in learning and in walking with him. <clears throat> it is kind of, uh, it is a, um, if, you, if you think about the hypostatic union, the, the union of divinity of God the Son and Jesus the man. It's called the hypostatic union. They're in perfect union. When we are saved, the human spirit plays much of that role with our soul. In reality, they're interchangeable many times because they are so wrapped into each other. And I talked about it last week that it is difficult for us to understand their differences. Okay, but that's what he's talking about. In reality, as a believer, we are kind of a wrap up of the human spirit. Uh, this is mean from a, uh, a New Testament term, not from human spirit as the world looks at it, um, meaning the, 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 uh, uh, the desire of, the, of that soul. It's many times used that way. This one's talking about specifically the divine part of us. The divine nature in us comes from the human spirit that in reality understands the scriptures and works intimately with the soul of man, the mentality. So the first verse here says, first part of the verse says, I pray. Um, that word's not actually there, okay? There's no pray there. Uh, um, the, the word actually there is the word hina, okay? And the word hina uh, means in order that or so that. It's, it's meant as a concluding final clause from the thing that's said before about the Father, about us getting a name. So it says so that and then he rolls into the sentence, okay? Um, it's not inappropriate. It, it, it's just not there. It's, it's appropriate to help us remind us that um, uh, we're in a prayer, okay? But it kind of misses that, that piece, uh, the so that, or in order that, because it, it reveals the goal. Um, out of, or the word I think is better, is according to his riches. His, of course, is the Father. Uh, the word here, one of my favorite words here, I just, one of the first Greek words always plutos. And it means rich. It means to be wealthy. In this context, it means the wealthy. It means that the wealthiness of God is being given to us, okay, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other word is the word doxa, uh, which is the word um, uh, uh, glory. And what this really is, this is really God's wealth. And many of us understand this as the capacity cup. Okay, capacity cup means that uh, the more doctrine that you learn and the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit and the more you walk with Christ, that's important in the next verse, the more you have the ability to know what God wants and you have the ability to do it. 
Okay, that's an important piece there. The capacity means that, uh, the difference in capacity means that if God gives you a million dollars and you are uh, in reversionism, many times that million dollars would become a curse to you. It would become a disaster because you don't know how to use it. God can take that same million dollars, give it to a growing, maturing Christian who has the capacity because he has the Holy Spirit to draw him. He is comforted in that. He knows the truth of how God wants him to handle it. He's prudent. He's intelligent. And what it does is it blesses him completely. So those are the differences. So when sometimes when a believer prays for a million dollars and God doesn't give it to him, he's actually blessing that person because that person couldn't handle it and it would make his life a train wreck. Okay? We know there's an example. People win the lotteries, right? When they win the lottery, what happens? They get all this money. They All of a sudden, everything goes a mess. They end up getting divorced. They, it just goes to tragedy. And it's because they don't have the capacity of character, of Christian character, God's character, to use it properly. So in these things right here, this particular context here, is in time. Now, there's glorious riches that are in phase three, in death, on the other side. Uh, the entrance door to uh, infinite wonder and, and blessings is actually death. And that's not the normal definition, but that's God's definition. But this one here, the glorious riches, is talking specifically about the riches and the wealth that God has provided us in time to live a holy life, to impact people in a divine way, and to fulfill his plan. Now the next word here says, he may strengthen you. Now the first word here, that he is obviously the father, we've talked about that, um, and this word means to give, but it's in the subjunctive, so it's contingent. The question is, what is it contingent on? Okay, and this is, this is contingent on fellowship, and on attitude towards God. Meaning that with positive volition, you want this. God is going to give you this wealth because you are in fellowship, you're growing in maturity, and God now knows He can give you more and more and more and more. And you will take that and you will multiply it towards His glory. Okay? That's what that contingent piece is there. But if you don't have that attitude, in reality, you're not interested in growing. You're, you know, one of these three groups down, actually these two groups, this is a temporary group here. You're only in it for a very short period of time. But the other two, um, if God gives you some of that provision, in reality, it would be catastrophic. You would make a mess. And actually, uh, he would discipline you with it. Um, there's more to say with that. But the word strengthen you here is, we're familiar with this word. It's uh, krati o o. Okay, it's a verb. And what it means, ruling power. This is where we get democrat or democratic. That crat is, is, the, is the verb here. And it means to become strong. And this is talking about spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. Now what's important about this is that's in the passive. And the passive means that he gives it to you. You don't take it. You don't have it on your own. And this is the may part. See, if I desire to walk with God and I desire to learn more and more about Him, the May contingent is fulfilled and that He will passively give it to us that we may have spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Okay? This is what I like about this verse here. If you look at it, we have uh, two powers. I'll read the second one in a minute. And we have a source of power. Two sources of power, okay? We have God the Father, who gives it to God the Holy Spirit, and then He gives it to us to utilize, okay? Um, and, and the fact that the two, two uh, divinities are here, Father and the Spirit, what is also here, the recipient of that is the inner being. That's you, okay? And it's contingent. So if you don't decide that you want to mature, in reality, you're not interested in Bible doctrine, um, you don't really want to follow the Lord's path, you will not get this. You'll be like every other, you'll be like the great majority of Christians are today. Okay? You'll be impotent. Why do you think this country is a train wreck? It's not because, it's because Christianity is essentially impotent. And it's impotent because of this verse. We do not have that strength. We do not have that maturity. We do not have the doctrine, which is the next one. 
Then, let me finish out the verse here. Now that I've had my commentary in there. With power through His Spirit. Through His Spirit, okay? That's the next piece of this verse. And the power here, you're familiar with the word, is the word dunamis, okay? Dunamis is where we get the word dynamite or dynamo. It means source of inherent power. It has power in itself. It's actually talking about the omnipotent power of God who has used that power to give to us in, uh, as an inheritance through Bible doctrine. This is really the result of epinosis doctrine, the full knowledge of God. It has power. And we know that, right? We know that the, the Word of God is alive and what? Powerful. That's right. This is this word right here. This makes it usable for us. Okay? God takes His power of His Word and makes it usable for us, for us to keep our balance and our direction and to make uh, right decisions. Now, the through part here, His Spirit, and His means Father. In this case, this is it the Father's uh, uh, Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. By the way, you, whenever it says Christ, the Spirit of Christ, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about Christ Himself. And, and we know that the Spirit works for both the Father and the Son, and their, His job is to magnify and glorify Christ Okay, and the Father. So the word here means, uh, dia is the word that's used in front of it, and the word is pneuma, we know that word pneuma, like pneumatic, okay? Um, and it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that makes him operational by the filling of the Holy Spirit, meeting the conditions we talked about here. Um, now the Holy Spirit becomes the operational power of the Christian versus the Christian's operational power, meaning his own power. It becomes divine power in us to achieve divine goals of the Father, of his plan. <clears throat> this is part of the glorious riches, right? This is part of it. This was never true before. Unless you were Moses and you banged your stick on the Red Sea and it opened up, um, Actually, I don't think he did that. He banged it on the rock. He held it up with the other one. But the, he becomes the conduit of power through us. This is one of his ministries. He has many of them. Okay? This is provided by the Father. Uh, in reality, it is given to us to succeed in his plan. Um, next word is that in your inner being. Uh, this is the, uh, the word um, uh, eso is the word in front of anthropos, anthropos meaning man, that talks about meaning inside. That's what that means there. Okay, so we put this word together, and it means the inner man, which is the, and for us, is the human spirit. Um, it is, um, the recipient is the one that gets all that power that we talked about before, okay? The glorious riches, that we may have it, Conditional whether, whether we're in fellowship and we're choosing our attitude to, to do God's will, okay? And then this, this is not a momentary thing, although it is like a switch in the, in the, in the, in the uh, power itself because it is conditional on your volition. Yes, I will. No, I won't. But this is actually a process, okay? Meaning that spiritual maturity is not an end. It is a process. So sometimes you can look and say, well, am I spiritually mature? Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, you, 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 you love the Lord. He's first in your life. Are you perfect? Let me, let, me, let me give it to you. You're not, okay? You will fail, which is why there's a conditional piece of this with respect to sin. If you sin, all you have to do is confess it because that sin was played for on the cross. It's citing it, okay? That's what 1 John means, 1 John 1, 9, when it uses the word homologeo, and that means, homo means to agree, it means the same, and logeo means what you say. So it means that your mentality agrees with the Lord. You realign yourself with Him, okay? Uh, so the important right here is to remember is that this is a may, okay? It's a conditional. It is contingent, as we, t as we talked about, okay? It is contingent on your desire to spiritually mature. Most Christians don't succeed because they really don't want to mature. What they want to do is they do have to do what they want to do and still be saved and still be kind of good when they want to be and then everybody to think they're wonderful people and think somehow that God will take that counterfeit. He will not. God accepts no counterfeits. Okay, We know that from faith in Christ. 
He does not take it. He does not accept it. Okay? So let's read some verses here. Um, the first one is, uh, that I have here is Ephesians 1.18. And my title for this one <coughs> is uh, Eyes of Your Heart, Enlighten, Confidence, Glorious Riches. This is one of the glorious riches that it's talking about here. And it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart now, the, I pray that the eyes, the eyes that we remember from months ago, that's the perceptive part. It's to be able to perceive something, to understand and see it. Of your heart doesn't mean this heart. It doesn't mean the one that's pumping. It doesn't mean the emotional side. Oops, sorry, tapping on that. Um, it means the mentality of the soul. It's the quintessence of your soul's thinking. It's that part where it resides, okay? May be enlightened. Uh oh what did we run into? May, that's right. We ran into may again. It means it's conditional. You have to do something to be on the condition that allows it. Otherwise, it's a no. You may be enlightened. How do you not be enlightened? You have negative volition towards Bible doctrine. You decide that, you know something, I don't need to study the Bible today. I don't really need to check in with God. I don't really need to walk with Him and expect Him to make something of that. You're going powerless into the world. You're going to get your butt kicked. Okay? So you might uh, suit up, right? Armor of God stuff. That's what this is. It says, you may be enlightened. That means to shed light on something. In order that, what's that mean? In order that means for the purpose of. That's what that means. The purpose that you may. Look at this, another may there. Okay? Know the hope. This isn't hope. I hope it happens. This is confidence. This is... I'm going to heaven, Jesus saved me, end of conversation. Okay, that's confidence. That's an example of confidence. Uh, knowing what phase three looks like and the rewards of Christ at uh, the judgment seat of Christ are ours is a confidence, not in us, but in the one who makes the promise. See, that's why salvation and Christ, faith in Christ is so important is because he's the one the promise is based on. He bought it. Okay, and he says here, to know the hope, confidence, to which he has called you. Okay, that's the calling of Christ. The riches of his glory. Okay, this is all phase two assets. Okay, every asset, the, the 36 things that, that God gives you are part of those assets at the moment of salvation. We talked about those. And he says the glorious inheritance of his holy people. Why is it an inheritance? Because some of those things will never, ever go away. Some of those things that you got, like the, like the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a permanent condition. Okay? It means that once you're saved, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is there as a seal for you. It is God's down payment on phase three promises of salvation and everything that comes afterwards. So, this is part of those riches confirmed in, in Ephesians 1, 18. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4, 16. And I, my title for this was that, not inward, but inner, renewed day by day by gap, which is a word that we use for the mechanical process that God provides. Some of us know it as Operation Z, where the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit for the God, that's a gift that he gives them. He speaks that, the Holy Spirit takes that, and he, and he actually gives it to your soul. And when your soul and, and human spirit agree that it, that doctrine is true, it becomes, the Holy Spirit moves it to that part that is epinosis, usable doctrine that you can actually use. Because you can know a doctrine and not use it, right? We've all experienced that. So he says, therefore, uh, we do not lose heart, which means we don't become discouraged. Though outwardly, now this is the context of this, is that, that they are being persecuted, okay? So he says, though outwardly we are wasting away. See, it means that they're being persecuted. They may be in prison. They may have people hate them. They may be being stoned. They may have people reject them. Whatever that is, he says, we may be wasting away here. And he says, yet inwardly, and the reason that word, I, I, that word inwardly is not inwardly. It means inner man. It's the exact word that's in our verse. Don't you wish they translated the same? <laughs> I do. He says, inwardly, the inner man, we are being renewed day by day. See, so that even though when we have tragedies in our life, even though somebody dies and we're desperate, we're just, we're just feeling that pain, 
that loss. In reality, inwardly, when we walk with the Lord, we still feel the grief, but we know where they're at. We know we have a confidence. We have a what's called a relaxed mental attitude where we are confident in the Lord. Okay, in that day by day part, this is what it says, just like I was saying a minute ago. This is the progress of the spiritual maturity. Progress does not arrive until we get to die. When we die, in reality, we've progressed on phase two. Everything else is going to be a resulting benefit depending on what you did in phase two in life. Okay, these are the rewards. Okay. Um, this is sometimes called, in, in the theologian books, experiential sanctification. Experiential sanctification happens through your whole life until, it, or it doesn't. You know, like this, if you, if you choose not to walk with God, if you're on the other side of this contingent, you actually don't experientially sanctify which means to, you don't get progressively better and better and better in your spiritual walk. You get worse and worse and worse until God disciplines you and finally takes you out. Um, didn't want to hear that, huh? This also reminds us that spirituality is an inside job. It's in here. It's in, I'd point here, but then you'd all get confused. It's an inside job. It, the whole process is to, has to do with the part that doesn't show out to anybody but us and God. It's our relationship. But in reality, as we grow and mature, it oozes out into the things we do and to the character we develop. Okay? It comes out of that. Now, Philippians 4.19 um, is another one. It says, uh, my title for this one is, Every need is not just met, but has a riches, which means overabundance. Okay? You're not, there's a thing called logistical grace, which means that God owes us as believer a living, as long as we don't go around making a mess of it. That's the idiot who says, says oh, I quit my job the other day because I couldn't stand my boss, and gee whiz, now we're losing our house, and we don't have any money. Uh, how God can do this to me? And he's like, well, you're an idiot. That's why. You don't understand what God's saying. If you throw something away, God's not responsible for trying to give it to you again. Okay? In reality, you made a, a, a bad decision on your poor doctrine. Okay? God does not just promise us logistical grace. He promises us with this if, this conditional, a overabundance. That's what plutos means. It means the wealth of God. Okay? So the verse says, uh, and my God will meet all of my needs. That's logistical grace. According to his riches, okay? And that's the superabundance. That's the overabundance. Remember we studied that about, uh, I don't know how many verses ago. to teach into a power. Okay? And there's also a piece in here that helps us understand this. So it says here, uh, I have much more to say. And this is Jesus talking, by the way. <clears throat> you know, I have much more to say, and he's talking to the disciples, before Christianity, before the cross. Okay? He's in his three-year ministry, three and a half. He says, I have much more than I can say than I can now, than you can now bear. Which means that they haven't matured enough for the, him to give them things, given where he's at, which is in the age of Israel when he speaks us. It's going to change when he gets on the other side of the cross in the resurrection, and 50 days after that, the Pentecost, where they're in the church age, where all this stuff will make more sense, and it will be fully expressed, which it is not, when he is on earth. Okay? He says, but when, but when he, the Spirit of Truth, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, note that, He's really telling us that it hasn't happened yet. When he comes, not yet, but when he comes, that comes, that day happens at Pentecost. He, Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. See, in reality, that's why the Holy Spirit is important to be in fellowship, so we can get and understand that truth. 
Then it goes on, it says, He will not speak on his own. <clears throat> he will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. That's prophecy. But notice this here. Many people, and I'm just kind of poking fun at the tongues movement right now, many people who glorify the Holy Spirit are doing something that is biblically incorrect. And what that means is that, notice here, it says that the Holy Spirit will not start creating His own stuff. He will do exactly what I tell Him, Jesus Christ, and He will do it only when I tell Him, and He will not do it outside anything I've told Him. Which means that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus Christ and the Father. He receives no glory. There's nothing in the scriptures that glorifies the Holy Spirit. Now, is he glorified? Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a part of the, um, the, the Trinity, of course. But not in this place and time. And we know that from scripture and no place else. There's nothing intuitive about this. That's why it's important to, to read the scripture to understand what God has revealed. Because what he reveals is true. We don't know it. We're not intuitive. We can't go, oh, I think the Lord's going to do it. No, no. If the Lord hasn't said it's going to happen, it's not going to happen. Because that's the way scripture is. We don't get the guess. Um, and he says, 14, here it comes here, he will glorify me because it is from me that he receives and he will make known to you, that's the mind of Christ he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 2.16. And then 15 says, all that belongs to the Father, this is the statement, axiomatic, all, to, all that belongs to the Father is, my, is mine. And that is why I said, <clears throat> the Spirit will receive from me and what He will make known to you, which means it's the only source. Okay? Bible doctrine comes from Jesus Christ. Okay? It's all there. Um, Colossians 1.27. My title for this is Christian, a glorious riches are in Christ, revealed through the mystery doctrines. And, you know, he says... To them, meaning Christians, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, because he revealed stuff before to the Jews. Remember, they had nothing. Now they have, in Christianity, they have everything. Um, and they are uh, fellow uh, servants with the Jews. Uh, among the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, and this is not one doctrine, this is many doctrines. The mystery doctrines, this was taught, it's the word mysterion which is Christ in you, okay? That's never been true before, okay? That is uh, Christ is to be in us. He is ours too, okay? And this also tells us that the glorious riches, that all that Christ has is ours as Christians, okay? And note that it swings into that, that Christ in you, the confidence of glory, okay? That's to us. When we walk with the Lord and we utilize these glorious riches, in reality, we bring glory to the Father, but also to us, which will be revealed by the uh, judgment seat of Christ. The, um, flip it over. Um, principles here are and I'll just say I'll just say the word and I'll explain it because some people don't understand. Gap, grace added for average per perception. This isn't ours. It's something will be uh, picked up with uh, another author who is uh, uh, R.B. Theme Jr. But it is it all it really means it is the mechanism for learning Bible doctrine. It is the mechanism. It's the spiritual mechanism described in a single word. So we don't have to keep talking about it. So I won't. <laughs> okay. The purpose is to equip. The purpose of Gap, the purpose of Operation Z, the purpose of the, the spiritual design God has to get us spiritual information is to equip the believer's soul. This is God's plan to direct us. That was the word kratoi, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> when we read up here in this verse, into our lives to straighten us for adversity, it's to strengthen us for adversity and for blessing. You actually need strength for both. Because if you get too many blessings, in reality, it can kind of knock your little gyroscope over and you make wrong decisions. For us in time 
and ultimately in eternity. This context here is in time. This is the daily life of the Christian to achieve God's plan and purpose. Okay, this is Matthew 4.4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And it is metabolizing, it's eating that Bible doctrine so you can actually feed the inner man inside of you so that you can know what to do in all circumstances. Now, next one here, next uh, principle, is that there are three powers in here. The Holy Spirit, whose ministry it is to teach the believer, the inner man, the human soul. Those two are here, uh, wrapped together as soul and human spirit. The truth of Bible doctrine is alive and powerful. It is the dunamis that it talks about to strengthen the um, spiritual maturity. It's passive because we receive it. It's, con it's subjunctive because we have to choose it. Okay, we have to choose it. So it takes plus volition. And this is in our daily lives, every day of our daily lives. And this, we have, this occurs through and when Jesus Christ is the center of our life, which is called occupation with Christ. We have him as the center of our life, and when he's the center of our lives in reality, it is occupation with Christ because he is our model. Okay? The author and perfecter. The man named Jesus perfected Christianity, and that's why we watch it. Uh, number three. By the power of the Holy Spirit, this verse is the first time he is mentioned in this entire epistle. Um, but we'll do what will develop from here forward. Um, let's read verse 17. At least I can get started on it. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Well, this is a big subject. Here again we have the Trinitarian view. Verse 15, the Father. Verse 16, the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, the Son, which is where we're now. The purpose of the strengthening of the Holy Spirit is so that Christ may indwell you. Okay? Note that that's really critical. What I want you to see and think about, it says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. What does that mean? It means that there is a potential here on two sides. One, he may not. Do you mean to tell me that Christ doesn't indwell all believers? That's right. It's a conditional clause. Okay? May. Or he may. If you meet the conditions, and says so, so that so that that means purpose, Christ may dwell in your hearts. Okay, this is your soul. Okay, your heart is your soul. It's fellowship. Okay, it's fellowship. It's talking about here. Um, Kenneth Weitz writes this. He says about the word dwell here. He says that Christ might, see it's another, it's another conditional word, that he might finally settle down and feel comfortable at home in your hearts. Okay, what does that mean? Is that in reality, Christ does not have fellowship with believers who are unstable. Okay, he doesn't. He can't. Why? Because you're unstable. Okay? You will find it in all the verses that we have following this. We'll be reading. We'll get to them today. Get to them next week. You will see that the fellowship that Christ has with the believer is conditional. It means that you don't always have the fellowship. In reality, the fellowship, I'll give you the summary since we're kind of running out here so you can think about it. The summary is that Christ will uh, have fellowship, will dwell in the believer's soul when that soul has made a decision, that's you and me, by the way, has made a decision to walk with him, to, to spiritually progress and be useful to him, useful in fulfilling his plans. Now, this doesn't change. We, it's very similar to, now, this doesn't change us from being in Christ. We are in Christ, okay? That's a, that's a permanent, that's a positional truth, they call it. 
but is Christ in us? And the answer is, this verse says may. These verses here that follow say may. May, 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 may. They're all conditional, which means that there are times when Christians do not have fellowship with Christ, and you can tell very easily because they don't walk with Christ. Okay? There, there is no, there are many Christians, there is no sign of their Christianity. Okay? And those people are the ones who do not walk hand in hand with Christ and have his fellowship. That is that joy and that peace that you have and Christ becomes comfortable being with you doing that and provides that fellowship with you for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean you lose it when you sin because you come right back in, right? You confess it. In reality, he knows where you're going. He knows where your heart has decided. You have made the choice to study and know and do his will. And that's what brings you there. So, um, I'm not going any further in this. Let me see, do I have any further in this? I'm going to read one more piece. Yeah, one more piece. This is one of my notes here. It says, It is the purpose of the Holy Spirit to use Bible doctrine to clean out our hearts. The mentality of the soul. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay? <clears throat> That's the thinking that it's shooting at. Romans 12, 2. We all know this. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. It is therefore the making of this place in our hearts, in our lives, for Christ to be at home in us. This is fellowship between Christ and the believer. And we'll read that when we get to it, the other piece of that, 1 John 1, 3. So let's close with that. Kind of preps you for where we're going with that. And um, I don't, I'm not going to apologize, but... What we have here in these three verses is very deep doctrine. So I'm hoping that I put them up here for the verses for you to study in advance. I don't keep erasing them with my hand. But so that you can study them in advance. And then when we talk about these doctrines, they won't be so overwhelming. You won't be overwhelmed with them as I'm telling you to them that you're trying to reconcile them. If you read these verses and what we've done here, when I say them, I'll just be connecting the dots for you. Okay? And it'll make more sense. So let's pray. We'll come back to it next week. Dearest, gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your truth that you write so clearly that we cannot get around it and that it tells us the things we're doing right, the things we're doing wrong, the things that are missing, the things that we're not. It explains what we see in our lives. I thank you for all the promises and the great and glorious riches that you have for us and pray, Lord, that you will draw us ever closer to a relationship with you. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.